Good afternoon to everyone in person and to all our speakers and guests joining virtually. My name is Jose Flores and I will be served as your master of ceremony today. I'm excited to present the 2023 Black History Month program. This year's theme of black resistance highlights the long history of struggle against oppression, racism, and discrimination that has been an integral part of the black experience in America. Historically, black colleges and universities have played a crucial role in the black community fight for social, economic, and political justice. They have provided access to higher education to African-American students who were often excluded from predominantly white institutions and have nurtured generations of black leaders, intellectuals, and activists. Historically, black colleges have also been at the forefront of the struggle for civil rights and social justice. Many HBCU students and alum play key roles in the civil rights movement, including the Montgomery boycott, bus boycott, the sit-ins, and the March on Washington. The spirit and values of HBCUs such as resilience, determination, and community are closely aligned with the themes of black history and black resistance. HB, HBCUs have always been the foundation of black resistance, excellence, and culture identity in their students and fostering a deep commitment to social justice and activism. In essence, HBCUs are the testament to the strength and resilience to the black community in the face of adversities. And they continue to serve as a source of inspiration and hope for future generations of black leaders and activists. Today, our speakers will share with us what black resistance is and what it means to them and how we can continue pressing forward. Next, Ms. Demetria McCain, Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for HFHEO, will give opening remarks followed by greetings from blacks in government, National President Honorable Shirley Jones. Well, good morning, good morning. I just want you to look around the room, look behind yourselves, look in front of yourselves. That second, a second ago, was black history. We are black history, so give yourselves a hand. My task today is to introduce you to someone, and reintroduce to some of you, someone who has worked on behalf of black communities, communities of color, and many, many people who are in the social condition of not having a lot of money, of having low incomes, of living in public housing. This person has worked on behalf of public housing residents for years. And now this person is working on behalf of those residents and others and communities and other people who have been forgotten and mistreated in history across the country by providing and uplifting us with giving us the resources, the staffing, and what we need to all of us here at HUD to get our jobs done. That person is the first black female deputy assistant secretary, deputy secretary, excuse me, deputy secretary for HUD. That person is none other than our very own Adrian Todman. Oh, that's sweet. Oh, thank you all. Thank you. Don't, don't, don't make me cry all up here in front of Dr. Fredericks. <laughs> Mess up my makeup. Hello, HUD. Hello, 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 hello. It is wonderful to see all of you here in this room for this very, very special moment of black history that we are created here in the Weaver Building. You know, during Black History Month, um, we tend to look backwards, and for good reason, for good reason, uh, because it, we take the time to learn something new about those who lived their lives before us who brick by heavy brick created the paths and the roads that we have the luxury 
to walk on today. So it's important that we always look back so we know how to move forward. But to Demetrius' point, history is all around us. It is all around us. It's, uh, it's in this building, this historic building that we live in. We feel like we live in, that we're working. <laughs> I feel like I live in this building. <laughs> That's not a bad thing. To the people on this stage that are here with us today, and to all of you who do the work that you do to impact so many people across this country and, dare I say, the world. But history is also in different pockets around the community in which we work. And I don't know how many of you are aware of some dramatic history that happened not too far from here, down in 7th Street Southwest, where there was a, a ship called the Pearl that in April of 1848, it was probably the largest or one of the largest attempts by enslaved people here in DC to free themselves and to escape slavery. Um, they were ultimately and sadly unsuccessful, but because of their audacity, because of their bravery, and quite frankly, because of the harsh penalty that many of them were served. That action, that brave action, right here on 7th Street, Southwest, that brave action propelled other actions that ultimately helped to end slavery here in Washington, D.C. Their, their goal was to sail down the Potomac, get to the Chesapeake, and to make their way to New Jersey. And sadly, and ultimately, they were stopped at a place in Maryland called Point Overlook and were recaptured. Um, I won't share more of the story with you because I encourage you to go and learn more about something that happened not too far from our footprint here. History is certainly all around us. It, is, it lives in our keynote speaker who has led, very ably led, the venerable Howard University all these 10 years. Congratulations, Dr. Frederick. Wonderful to have you here with us. It, it lives with our secretary. It lives with our vice president. It lives with our most recent member of the Supreme Court. It lives with the work of this department and this administration that's taken the boldest drives to bring equity and to center equity in the work that we do, whether it is HUD, or Treasury, or State, or Education, or Labor. I could go on and on to center equity in what we do. You know, Demetria had it right. Um, we are history. We are certainly tomorrow's history. Carrying our own bricks, right? Laying the paths for the folks who will come after us. Paths that they will walk in luxury as well because of the hard work that we are doing right here, right now. Happy Black History Month, my brothers and sisters. I look forward to sharing the rest of this moment with you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me to your 2023 Black History Month program. On behalf of the National Organization of Blacks in Government, I bring greetings to Madam HUD Secretary, Madam Deputy Secretary Todman, Howard University President Wayne Frederick, and to the entire HUD family. I am so very excited to be here with you today. I will keep it brief so that you can get to the very important matters at hand. But for all of you here today, if you don't remember anything about me after today, please remember these three things. I am Alabama bred, I am Spelman College fed, and I am honored to be serving as the 15th <coughs> National President of Blacks in Government. Now, regarding Black Development, thank you. Now, regarding Blacks in Government, 
I am humbled to be leading an organization that has been addressing diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility long before those terms were in vogue, long before the Office of Personnel Management was asking employees if they felt valued through an annual employee viewpoint survey, and long before the Partnership for Public Service was ranking agencies as the best places to work in the federal government, including with regard to their diversity efforts. And I can tell you that I am personally very proud to be a part of an organization that continues to use its resources and talents to promote Black excellence and to celebrate Black history. Now, I've given you quite a few I am so far, but since it's Black History Month, I'm going to give you two bonus I am's. I am a history maker, and that's because I am the first and only African-American female in my agency's 100-plus year history to hold a senior executive service position in our Office of General Counsel. But importantly, in the words of Vice President Kamala Harris, I am the first, but I won't be the last. Not if I have anything to do with it, not if Blacks in government has anything to do with it, and not if any of you who believes the quality of our work increases as we learn from our differences, not if you have anything to do with it. Now, enough about me. Since this year's Black History Month theme is Black resistance, I want to use the remainder of my time to share just a little bit with you about how Blacks in government's establishment was indeed a form of Black resistance. You see, BIG was founded in 1975, the same year that the Vietnam War was ending, the country was in a recession, the overall unemployment rate was 9.2%, and the unemployment rate for African Americans was almost 15%. In fact, job growth and advancement was stagnant. But perhaps more importantly, for the establishment of Blacks in government, we were not that far removed from major gains of the civil rights movement, including the 1963 March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom, the 1964 Civil Rights Act, as well as the passage of the 1965 Voting Rights Act, all of which were still meeting resistance. But let's not forget that it was not until 1972 that major aspects of EEO laws were applied to government workers. So let's not be idealistic enough to think that our government in 1975 was a model employer welcoming African Americans and women and giving them equal pay. But thankfully, the world has come a long way since 1975, as has our government, which I do believe strives to be a model employer. While we do still, of course, have as our mission to create a level playing field so that all employees, and I do mean all employees, have the same equal opportunity to succeed, our advocacy is in partnership with our agency officials and has a much broader perspective. From career development training to networking and mentoring, youth scholarships and community outreach projects, BIG offers a wide array of programs and services, including our very popular National Training Institute that brings together government employees from all across the country for four days of training sessions led by senior executive service members and industry experts. Enough about big. Dr. King once said, change does not roll in on the wheels of inevitability, but comes through continuous struggle. With that in mind, I close by saying we are in the struggle 
for greater diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility together, whether it be in the workplace, whether it be in our community, whether it be related to fair employment, equal health care, quality housing, or unbiased policing. God bless you all, and thank you for the opportunity to provide greetings as you continue the tradition of ensuring that Black excellence is promoted and that Black History Month is celebrated. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McCain and Ms. Jones for your remarks. Now, Ms. Kiara Law, who is a Howard University alum and senior financial analyst in the Office of Multifamily Housing, will introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Wayne Fedrick, president of Howard University. Ooh, it is bright up here. Good afternoon, everyone. It is very bright up here. <laughs> My name is Kiara Law, and I am the Senior Financial Analyst for the Multifamily Housing here at HUD, and as well, a proud graduate of the prestigious Howard University. It is my honor and pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Howard University President, Dr. Frederick. Howard University, also known as the Mecca, is the most prominent of the historically black colleges and university, or HBCUs. Our founding father, General Oliver Otis Howard, was quoted as saying, the opposition to Negro education made itself felt everywhere in a combination not to allow the freedmen any room or building in which a school might be taught. It was established in 1867 after the Civil War to educate free black slaves. Prior to the Civil Rights Act of 1964, black people were incessantly denied admission to traditionally white colleges. I am a connector in research to the, soul, to the soul of my being. And once I found out that I was getting the privilege to introduce my alma mater's president, I was excited to find out how we connected beyond our admiration for Howard. This is what I found. Dr. Frederick is from the island of Trinidad and could be a cousin. <laughs> my father is from Grenada and we have several relatives that migrated to Trinidad. I have to research that after today. Diagnosed with sickle cell anemia at birth, doctors believed he wouldn't live past the age of eight. As a result of being hospitalized three to six times a year and his mom being a nurse, he became interested in science to help himself and others. Enrolling at HU at the age of 16, he was constantly encouraged by teachers, doctors, and peers through any adversity and never told what he couldn't do. Instead, he was surrounded and affirmed by what blacks could and did accomplish. I know firsthand how attending Howard makes you feel as though you're visiting family that you didn't even know you had. It embodies the old adage that it takes a village to raise a child, while it guides you into the adulthood equipped with the knowledge and tools to face the inevitable challenges that crosses your path. Dr. Wayne A.I. Frederick is the 17th president of Howard University and a true son of Howard, having earned not one, not two, but three degrees from the university. I thought I loved Howard, he's got me beat. <laughs> a BS in 1990, an MD in 94, and an MBA in 2011. As president of Howard, Dr. Frederick has worked to strengthen internal operations in order to enhance the student experience and position the university to more effectively serve the community. He has overseen a period of immense growth and transformation at Howard, including record-breaking enrollment numbers and philanthropic donations. He is an expert on healthcare disparities and devotes his time to speaking about and advocating for social justice, as well as diversity, equity, and inclusion. Dr. Frederick is a distinguished Charles R. Drew Professor of Surgery at the Howard University College of Medicine and a practicing cancer surgeon at Howard University Hospital, where he continues to see patients and perform surgeries. I am personally thankful for Dr. Dr. Frederick's dedication to cancer research and practicing medicine. If it were not for doctors like him, I may not be here today. 
It was a year ago that I was diagnosed with highly aggressive form of metastatic breast cancer. And my team of doctors told me how not too long ago, my chances of survival were slim to none. With God's grace and mercy, and dedicated doctors like Dr. Frederick, it's why I am standing in front of you today. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thanks, thanks guys. I am still going through my fourth phase of treatment therapy, but I'm all right. Dr. Frederick also serves on the boards of numerous institutions and organizations, including the Federal Reserve Bank of Richmond and Humana Incorporated. He is also a member of surgical and medical associations, including the American Surgical Association, the American Cancer Society, the American College of Surgeons, and an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine. This Black History Month theme centers around resistance, black resistance. Dr. Frederick personifies this phrase. Education, even learning to read was forbidden during slavery and is an essential component of black resistance. The audacity to finish university, become a doctor, a professor, and the president of the top HBCU while still operating in surgeries he is the culmination of his ancestors' wildest dreams and the fears of any white supremacist. Yeah. Nelson Mandela said it best, education is the most powerful weapon that you use to change the world. Stand and help me welcome Howard University President, Dr. Wayne A.I. Frederick. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. you're welcome. Good afternoon. I, I think I recognize that theme song. <clears throat> I feel like I'm at home. I just drove down the street, but I feel like I'm in a, another Howard building. So first, let me start by thanking this law for a very kind um, introduction, and as well for your own testimony, because part of resistance is presence, and uh, your willingness to share your own story um, is one that I appreciate. Uh, I want to recognize and thank the Robert C. Weaver chapter of Blacks in Government for the invitation and certainly uh, take the opportunity to acknowledge the chapter president, uh, Stephen Matthews, uh, for your uh, kind invitation this afternoon. I uh, also want to recognize the Blacks in Government national president, Honorable Shirley Jones, uh, who we heard from, and certainly acknowledge our HUD Secretary, Marcia Fudge, and Deputy Secretary uh, Tudman, who, whom I've had the opportunity to meet um, uh, previously as well, so thank you for your service uh, to our nation. Now, recognizing that um, church is not for uh, the faithful only, but it's actually for sinners, um, is what I try to tell my theme. Every time somebody asks me to give one of these talks, that's the first thing that I, I do. I have to look out into the audience and figure out whether I'm at choir practice or I'm really at service. <laughs> and I feel comfortable that I'm at service today. And I think that that's important because one of the things about resistance is making sure that people recognize what you're resisting against and that people hear your message and you're not just resisting for the sake of resisting, um, but we're resisting to make things better for everybody. And I think that that's very important for us to recognize. I'm certainly honored to be here. HUD has been a major friend to Howard University over the years and recently helped us establish a center of excellence for housing urban and economic development research. So it is certainly my pleasure and a privilege to be asked to, to speak today. I'm a little bit hoarse, so I'm not trying to give you my quiet storm voice. <laughs> uh, as you heard in my bio, I am from Trinidad and there was a little small festival there last week. Uh, <clears throat> and, and, that, and that might have, and that, it's a small little carnival, that's a, a, a few hundred or thousands of people, but so my voice is a little bit hoarse as a result, but I'm sure you can bear with me. Your annual Black History Month program is of significant importance because of Robert C. Weaver as a historical figure. So I certainly want to start there. Robert C. Weaver obviously was the very first secretary of HUD, 
and the very first African American to be appointed to the United States cabinet. This morning, I was at a board meeting with Secretary Alfonso Jackson, who is a former Secretary of HUD and actually sits on Howard's board. And it was interesting because I told him I was coming here to speak and our meeting almost got derailed because he started telling me so much about this building, the architect, this conference room, et cetera. And so the other thing that it reminds me as we think about resistance and we think about the theme today and we think about what we're I hope you're going to get from this message is that these things are not about theories, they're not about bricks and mortar, they're not about legacy, but they ultimately are about us. And that resistance has to be a living, breathing aspect of who we are every single day, every waking moment. And it has to be an aspect of all of us. Because oftentimes when we think of resistance, we think of those who are oppressed. And what we don't recognize is if there's one amongst us who is oppressed, all of us are oppressed. As you heard in my uh, bio, I have sickle cell. And the reality is that the pain that I experience in my sickle cell crisis is a pain that nobody without sickle cell would ever experience. But it's a pain that would never be eradicated if everybody does not have empathy with my own experience. And that is something that I've had to learn. The people that I have admired the most and the people that have nothing to do with sickle cell would never experience that pain that I would experience. My mother, I would use her as my example. My mother who, I'm the oldest of three boys, would work a shift during the day, come home and cook for my brothers and then come back to the hospital to switch a shift with someone else to work at night so she could be in the same hospital where I was hospitalized. That's what resistance is about. And so that resistance sometimes is about health, sometimes it's about poverty, sometimes it's about access. But the reality is that ultimately what it's about is about human dignity. And this organization, HUD, probably respects human dignity in a way that no other organization in our federal government has the opportunity to. And I hope that you'd recognize that. Howard University was founded on March 2nd, 1867. And when you invited me to speak, I'm not sure that you recognize that. Just a couple of days from today, we will celebrate Howard's existence into being 156 years of that existence. On March 2nd, 1867, President Johnson, Andrew Johnson, signed into existence Howard University. It is the only federally chartered HBCU. On the same day that he would sign into existence Howard University, he would veto the first Reconstruction Acts. So the first thing that I want you to recognize about resistance is that great things happen in messy democracies like ours. And think about how we view our democracy today, how cynical we can be about the things that are taking place. It couldn't have been more cynical on March 2nd, 1867. You had a president who was a misogynist and a known racist, and he signed into existence this institution, Howard University, probably because he didn't think it would survive. And on the same day that he signed it into existence, he vetoed the first Reconstruction Acts. He also, and today I often like to say that he may be turning around in his grave, gave rise to an institution that would lead to the first black female vice president in, pre in Vice President Kamala Harris. <laughs> None of that is something that he believed in. But without the stroke of his pen and his signature, Howard University wouldn't exist today. The charter for Howard hangs in my office, so I see it every single day. And it just reminds me that not everybody who is with us is part of our resistance. But everybody will contribute, and we will force them to contribute by being, by being strong, by being committed, and by consistently showing up and being excellent. So when you think of that resistance, I want you to think of those three things, and that would be a recurring theme. Now, the audacious nature of why Howard University was created was obvious. You had post-Civil War, an environment in which freed, formerly enslaved people moving from the South to the North needed somewhere, first and foremost, to get health care. And most people don't realize this, but Howard University was predated five years by Freedman's Hospital. And that hospital was built for the purpose of providing care to those who were moving 
from the south to the north. And as that success of that hospital occurred, they decided 17 men in a congressional church that they needed to start a university to educate freed slaves moving to the, to the north. They didn't start a seminary. Most of the great universities in America today were started as seminaries. Howard University wasn't started as a seminary. Sometimes people tell me, well, Howard was started as a normal school. It wasn't started as a normal school. It was audaciously started as a university on that very first day. Howard University would have a medical school just a few years later. And that medical school would have two black faculty members on it, one of whom would take care of a United States president who was injured, um, <clears throat> and he would provide care, like other surgeons at that time, to that United States president. Just think of that, a black surgeon in the 1870s providing care to a wounded US president. Unfortunately, back then, we didn't know much about manure and gloves and antibiotics. And so he, like others, probed that president's wound every single day after getting off their horse. So a wound that may have healed on its own, unfortunately, got infected by probing that wound. A different kind of resistance, you'll call that. <laughs> and so unfortunately, that wound passed out. We would learn a lot about that since then. Now, I want to talk to you a couple of things about resistance. And when we, talk, when we talk about resistance, how I want you to think about resistance. Resistance has always been in the DNA of black people in America. We came here with resistance. We were brought here with resistance. And it is that resistance that in many ways formed the foundation of this great country. Because resistance does not always get a prize, get acknowledged, or get rewarded. But nothing exists in this world without resistance. Nothing worth having exists without resistance. And that's why the role that we play in this American story is so incredible and so important. Now, you have to remember, it was illegal for slaves in many parts of the country to learn how to read or write. And now you have an institution just up the street that promoted that. I told you earlier in a jocular manner that I was in Trinidad last week for a celebration. That celebration was actually born out of resistance. White slave owners in many Caribbean countries, including Trinidad, would set aside two days for debauchery and demagoguery. They would allow the slaves to have two days to party and hang out and make a mockery of uh, the white slave owners. So they would give them their old clothes and old shoes. And the slaves would dress up like them and mimic them and mock them. And while they would sit in their porches and look on and smile and shake their heads at the silliness of the slaves, the slaves were actually telling stories to each other about their slave masters and about the resistance that they were going to put up. And that tradition goes on today in the form of carnival, which has taken on a very different form, a very different expression. But it was born out of that experience. And so I think it's important for us to also recognize that evolution of those types of experiences are also important to our nation's fabric as well. The beauty in black resistance is that what benefits black people, what frees black folks, is actually beneficial for everyone in the aggregate. And while Howard was founded to uplift African Americans, Howard gave a platform and an opportunity for a surgeon by the name of Charles R. Drew, who during the World War would figure out a way to bank blood so that the war could be won, won by the ability to provide transfusions to wounded soldiers. That didn't, that didn't just benefit black Americans. That benefited white Americans. It benefited America. It benefited Asian Americans. It benefited Hispanic Americans. So the invention and creativity of the black American is one that has always served this nation in good stead. And so the other thing that we must recognize is that when we try to promote what must happen for us as a people, it is to promote what's best for America. Because America will always continue to be as strong as all of its people. Equality and equity mean leveling the playing field sometimes. And so there's a slide, 
I use sometimes when I'm giving a talk with an appropriate slide that shows three people of different heights trying to watch a soccer game. And that first slide, I title Equality, because on that first slide, we give each person the same stepping stool to see over the fence to the soccer game. But what do you think happens? The tallest person gets to see even more of the game, more than they need to see. The person at middle height finally gets to see over the fence. But the shortest person, that stool is still not enough. They don't get to see the playing field. The second slide shows what we today deride as affirmative action because it gives the shortest person two stools to step on, it gives the middle person one stool and it doesn't give the tall person anything. And so the opponents of affirmative action today will say to you that denying that tall person what they may have earned is unfair. And I have to admit, I don't have a very strong argument against that because my focus is on the shortest person who can now see the field. But what I will tell you is, ultimately, that's not what we should be focused on. Not equity and not equality. What we should be focused on is justice. And ultimately, justice is if we remove the fence so that everybody can see the playing field. <clears throat> then it means that your height and where you start in this life does not dictate what you will have access to. What it ultimately means is that if you have ambition and you have conviction to change your circumstance, we would provide the tools by removing the barriers. And that's what I do as Howard University's president. I simply am trying to remove barriers from young people who have an opportunity now to go on to succeed. And why is that necessary? You might say, well, today, Students can go anywhere. I have an 18-year-old son who's on a soccer scholarship at Duke University. He can get into schools that I couldn't even dream of going to. And that is true. But let me also be clear to you about what's taking place in America today. In a country of 330 million Americans, last year, Howard University sent the largest number of black students in this country to medical school. <clears throat> While I appreciate your applause, there's a very sad side of that story. It was 95 students. In a country of 330 million Americans, we sent 95 African Americans to medical school, and we were at the top of the heap in this country of sending African American students to medical school. In 1978, there were more African-American males matriculating in our medical schools than in 2014. Last year, that number went up by 22%. That number is back down this year. It probably went up the year prior because of the pandemic. Students didn't have to travel. They got Zoom interviews. And now that we've opened back up, that has gone away again. So when we look at a pandemic, that disproportionately took the lives of people of color, and then we look at the care providers in this country, we cannot be surprised by the disparity in those outcomes. We cannot be surprised by who dies. And as I tell my students up the street, and as I will tell all of you as employees here, you don't have to go to the far reaches of America to look for its problems. In Ward 7 and 8, the life expectancy of an African-American male is 22 years less than a white woman in Ward 3. You could probably calculate the distance between those two wards. And in case you need help, it's less than six miles. And it's exactly equidistant from the US Capitol. A black man in Ward 7 and 8 is going to live 22 years less than a white woman in Ward 3, right here in the nation's capital. We don't have to go to any far-flung country to look for the largest inequities that exist in our society. And what must we put up against that? Resistance. We must have resistance to making sure that we are not ignorant to those facts, that we don't come into this building every day and recognize that equidistant from right here, this HUD building, 
there's a disaster, a critical disaster taking place in our country that we have a responsibility to make sure that we embrace. Now, you may ask the question, how do we turn that resistance into an embrace and to ensure that we solve that problem? Well, I'm going to give you a couple of things before we touch on that. The first is, it starts with us. We must first examine what we do. So when I started at Howard University as president, I had 13 schools and colleges, which means I had 13 deans. One of them was a woman. The DNA of Howard is social justice. Now, I'll tell you, my alum will call me about all kinds of things about homecoming. Right. They'll call me to tell me who should sing, the order they should sing in, the size of yard fest. But not one of them called me to complain about the fact that of the 13 deans, only one was a woman. There's something wrong with that, right? That's a lack of resistance. It's a lack of presence. It's a lack of proactivity. And so that charity must begin at home. So I decided that we were going to have gender balance search committees. I would not interview finalists unless one of the three finalists was a woman. And everybody had to go to unconscious bias training and cultural competency training. That last part, for any of my Howard alum in here know, was massive resistance. People said, Howard, you want me to go to cultural competency training? Come on, unconscious bias training. Not one single person who sat on that committee has gone to that training and come back and said it was useless. Why? Because we all have unconscious bias training. We all do. Within seconds of meeting someone or seeing someone, we make an assessment of everything. Is that guy tall enough? Is he good looking enough? Is he dark enough? Somebody saw me and said, I'm sure he was in Trinidad. He had a tan. <laughs> right? We are constantly processing what we see and hear to draw a conclusion. And that conclusion is part of our bias system, whether we want to admit it or not. But let me tell you what has happened since. We now have 14 schools and colleges at Howard, and 11 of those deans are women. <clears throat> so part of your resistance cannot be apathy. And that's the first thing that I want to tell you. The second thing that I want to tell you is that we don't have to have complex solutions for simple problems. We all want another Brown versus the Board of Education law, another Civil Rights Act to solve the problems of today. But let me give you one simple fact. Prior to Brown versus the Board of Education, the segregation of schools in the South was unbelievable. Today, in the South, there are more schools with 75% of one race or ethnicity than there were before Brown versus the Board of Education. And you know why that is? That's because you cannot legislate love or hate. Neither. You cannot legislate it. You can condone it. You can put laws on the books that make it easier to hate and to love. But you ultimately cannot get people to do what they should do. And that is the right thing. We have successfully, as a society, lived in a way to segregate ourselves from one another. We have red states and blue states. We have redlining that occurs to create districts that would vote a certain way reliably because we know that we don't want to live next to each other. There's no law that's going to stop that. What we have to do is we have to take the individual responsibility to make sure that that does not continue to spread. And that apathy is part of what is destroying us today. And it doesn't have to be complicated. I'll tell you a story. I lived in Connecticut with my wife. And at that time, we didn't have kids, so we would go to Manhattan every two weeks for fun. Don't tell the people in Connecticut I said that. <laughs> One day, we were staying at a hotel in Times Square. And I got on the elevator. 
and a guy who looked like Alec Baldwin, and I know that's not popular to say right now, but he did look like Alec Baldwin, got on the elevator. So here's a white guy that looked exactly like Alec Baldwin in Times Square, gets on the elevator with myself and four other people. He looked around the elevator and said, hi, how you doing? Oh, that's a beautiful tie. I love your shoes. Wasn't the weather outside nice? I got off the elevator and I practically ran to my room. And I said to my wife, I just met the most interesting guy in the elevator. I said, that guy in the elevator spoke to everybody. He made eye contact. It was the most amazing thing. She looked at me quite calmly and said, you must be crazy. We're in Times Square and a guy got on the elevator and spoke to all of you. And he doesn't know you. He must be a serial killer. <laughs> and I thought, geez, the cynicism. But I accepted it. She was right. We were in Times Square. You shouldn't talk to strangers. <laughs> that evening, we would go to dinner. And we would get in the elevator. And you can guess who would get on the elevator with us. Alec Baldwin looking guy. And I just cracked a smile immediately. The guy got on the elevator. He said hi to everybody again. And he looked at my wife and said, you are gorgeous. My wife started to beam. <laughs> We got off the elevator and she said, oh my God, that's the nicest guy I've ever met. <laughs> and I said to her, that's the same guy I just told you about <laughs> yesterday. But let me tell you what's behind my story. Think of on your way to this talk, how many of you got on the elevator and checked your cell phones? You just got on the elevator. Nobody emailed you since you got on the elevator. <laughs> but we all do it. It's almost a reflex action. The essence of the human condition is interaction, not isolation. That's what the pandemic taught us. The pandemic taught us that even if you are an introvert, you want to interact with people. You just don't want them to talk to you, <laughs> right? Introverts love to hear people talk. Just don't talk to me. So the point is, as I tell my employees, if you email somebody three times about something, don't let that be a transactional relationship. Go meet that person, have coffee with them, find out who they are. When you get on the elevator, look people in the eye and say hi. Because that ultimately, every single day, every single interaction is our opportunity to break down the resistance of hate and to elevate the opportunity that love provides. Every single day, every single opportunity. There's no law, there's nothing that Congress needs to pass to, for us to make the lives of somebody else better by simply saying hello, by simply introducing ourselves, by simply respecting the dignity of the human presence. And that ultimately is what HUD is doing. HUD ultimately is trying to give everybody in this country an opportunity to, for the fullness of their dignity. But think of how often you pass up that opportunity when you simply get on the elevator. You, you guys are going to work hard to get people shelter, to get people affordable housing. But your colleague who may be hurting, who may be going through the greatest stress of their lives, getting their last chemo treatment, you don't look that person in the eye and say hi every single day. So we have an opportunity. So don't take simple problems and provide complex issues to them. And I'm going to close with this. While I recognize that black resistance is something that can sound offensive, we have labeled and continue to be offended by identity, by the expression of identity, by the expression of presence. What I hope you will do as a collective in this organization and also in your communities at home is to recognize that that resistance is a beautiful thing. Because the last thing that I want you to take away is that that resistance must be excellent. Charles R. Drew once said to a group of surgical trainees that excellence of performance will transcend all artificial barriers created by man. Let me repeat that. Excellence of performance will transcend all artificial barriers created by man. I don't care what the color of your skin is, what your gender is, who you choose to love. Every day you have an opportunity to show up and provide excellence. Excellent service, 
expand your knowledge base, not just for what you do, but how you can assist others. And every single day that you do that, you will transcend every artificial barrier that has been created. And that ultimately is the ultimate resistance, in my opinion, being excellent. Because every time you are excellent, you provide a resistance that somebody else can never give a demerit against. And I think that HUD is an excellent place with excellent employees. I definitely know the deputy secretary thinks that way. And you make an excellent choice today by coming out here today in your HBCU gear. <laughs> and so I want to thank you for having me, and I want to thank you for all that you do every day. And I mean what I said earlier. This agency, in my, this department, in my opinion, there's a lot the federal government gets knocked about doing. But the dignity that you give people every single day is something that is very, very humbling. And every time I come into this building and I get an opportunity to meet you, I get an opportunity to be so grateful for what you do for others. So thank you on behalf of everyone in the nation, those of us with shelter and without. You provide the dignity of the human experience in a way that no one else can. Thank you very much. <laughs>
That's what made us, that's why we're celebrating, because we, we were able to overcome some resistance. And uh, it took me a while to learn that. There, it took a few years for me to really celebrate, not only Black History Month, but other, other uh, observances as well, because sometimes we can really get caught up in those things and forget about what's really important. And as we move forward here, the day after tomorrow, I guess, signifies the end of Black History Month for many. But for most of us, it's just a refreshing. You know, we, we're just pushing a, re, a restart button. And now we get to look at it from what have we done from March 1st to January 31st. Then we could come in next February and have an even greater Black History celebration than we've had today. Now, in order for us to do that, there are three things that we have to really move forward and three perspectives we have to look at it. As Dr. Frederick mentioned, we have to learn, we have to look at it from the individual perspective. What have I done to move the needle in black history? You know, have I done all that I can do to move the needle forward? We're all members of a team here at HUD. We are a team. Have we done everything as a team to move the needle? Has it returned to black inequalities and issues in our community? And more importantly, has an agency. What has HUD done to move the needle forward? And we know we've done some great things here at HUD. And one of the reasons why I even chose to be here was because of our mission. I wanted to be a part of this. You know, I was fortunate and blessed to have other offers to be CDO at other places, but there was something about HUD. It was something about what we do here. I wanted to be part of something great. And I wanted to certainly continue to move the needle forward. So I, like I said, uh, I wasn't going to be before you long. I just wanted to come here on behalf of our office, introduce our office, let you know who I am, and let you know that my email address is easy to find, reggie.r.hub. Please reach out uh, for any initiatives, anything you want to move forward. And I certainly look forward to working with you here at headquarters. And even more importantly, I look forward to working with you all in the field. Thank you. In the service of time, we're going to make a, 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 a quick change. We need a, if we're going to take some group photos up here with the big, BI, the big officers and HBCU. Uh, we're going to do a presentation and the photos. It, gotcha. Anybody who's uh, HBCU alum, we're going to do alum. Oh, in their in their in their in their uh, uh, stuff they have. We're gonna take quick photos of. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, if you can have a seat, we just have a couple more items left on the agenda. Uh, my name is Stefan Matthews. Uh, I currently serve as the acting president of the Robert C. Weaver Chapter of Blacks in Government. Just give them a round of applause. Um, I also serve as the regional council president for Blacks in Government Region 11. 
Thank you. Uh, Blacks in Government Region 11 is the largest region of Blacks in Government. Uh, Blacks in Government is made up of 11 regions. Um, currently, I have, we have about close to 6,000 members in the D.C. area and 51 chapters, including the Robert C. Weaver HUD chapter. So let's give them a round of applause. Um, before we moved on, I just wanted to thank all of our speakers today, Dr. Frederick, Deputy Secretary Todman, for taking time out of their day to join us. I also wanted to uh, thank and publicly rec recognize members of the Robert C. Weaver Planning Committee uh, for the Black History Month program. Um, so uh, ladies, if you'll stand up, you know who you are. Stand up, please. Um, and we have one member, uh, Cynthia Lane, who uh, she's our chapter secretary. She is not here to, she's not able to join us today. Um, but uh, without Cynthia um, and the ladies that just stood up, this event would not have taken place. So let's give them all a round of applause. <laughs> oh, she's well. <laughs> um, and so really quickly, um, I just wanted to um, uh, thank everybody again for joining us. And, um, you know, this program, it's, it's a legacy of this program, Black History Month program, um, and the Robert C. Weaver chapter um, actually putting on the program. And I just wanted to uh, take, a, take some time to just uh, say a few words about two of our members who we lost in 2021, our former chapter president, LaWanda Young, um, and Isabel, Isabel Brown, who were members of HUD, um, and they also were very significant in uh, our Black History Month programs and our Martin Luther King Jr. Month programs as well. Um, so uh, I wanted to give them a round of applause and their memory um, because without them, this chapter would not have be where it is today. So let's give them a round of applause as well. And finally, um, as the national president Shirley Jones mentioned, um, I invite everyone in this room to join us August the 28th through the 31st, right up 295 at the Gaylord National um, Convention Center for our 44th Annual National Training Institute. So it's August the 28th through the 31st. It's open for all government employees to attend, and I hope to see you all there. Thank you, and enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Okay. Wow, hey, th uh, <clears throat> thank you, Howard University, um, for coming up here and, and, and and I want to thank you for attending the 2023 Black History Month program. We appreciate those who attended in person and virtually. And for those that are watching virtually, please watch the short uh, video, uh, which is talking about Black History Month. For those in person, please join us in Auditorium C for the reception, photos, and networking with guests. Thank you, and have a great week. Thank you very much. Hoo-wah. All right.